there are lulls to your work. So it's like when you look at the red carpet and you're like, Beyonce's not doing anything. Okay, so if I'm Beyonce's makeup artist, what would I be doing? So I'd be, you know, away from her at that time. Fortunately, I made a career working with a number of women and I diversified. So if I'm not with Gabrielle Union, I'm with Queen Latifah. If I'm not with Queen Latifah, I'm with Vanessa. If I'm not with Vanessa, I'm with Cynthia Erivo. Um, you have to, you know, make sure to not hedge your bets, but stay connected to everyone that you can so that when that celebrity is not in season or working or doesn't have a project to promote, that you can stay busy. And if, if it happens that you, you know, all of your girls are down, then you're right a book. Welcome to the Friends in Beauty podcast, a safe space for ambitious beauty industry creatives to have real talk, get real answers and practical tools to grow their businesses. My name is Aquia Robinson, and I'm a makeup artist, beauty educator, and the creator of Friends in Beauty. I created Friends in Beauty to support like-minded creatives, just like you, on their quest to connect, network, and build genuine relationships within the beauty community. Join me every week as me and my special guests reveal the keys to success and longevity in the beauty industry, and most importantly, have fun while doing it. You ready? Hey, what's up? It's your best friend in beauty, Aquia Robinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Friends in Beauty podcast. I am so happy to have you here, and I hope you're listening to this episode in high spirits and in good health. If you are a friend in beauty, I welcome you to join the Friends in Beauty Facebook community. If you're looking for a community of like-minded, ambitious friends in beauty to virtually connect with, network and share resources, then click the link down below in the show description to join us in the Facebook community and I'll be there to welcome you with open arms. Also, let's get social. Follow Friends and Beauty on all social media platforms at Friends and Beauty. Additionally, the Friends and Beauty podcast is available on several platforms. We're on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google, YouTube, you name it, we are there. And whatever platform you are listening from right now, I just want to say thank you so much for tuning into the Friends of Beauty podcast. I appreciate it more than you know. And I would love it even further if you took the time to leave a five-star rating, a review, a like, a comment, a share, a subscribe, a something (laughs) to let me know how you feel about the Friends of Beauty podcast. Additionally, Friends in Beauty is now on Patreon, so for as little as $3 a month, you can support the Friends in Beauty podcast, and there are also several tiers available that unlock Patreon-exclusive content just for you, like behind-the-scenes content of the Friends in Beauty podcast, bonus interview clips, a monthly Ask Me Anything, discounts, and so much more. So if that's something that you're interested in, I'll leave the link down below in the show description for that as well. Also, if you'd like to stay connected even further, join the Friends in Beauty mailing list tribe. They are the first to know about all things Friends in Beauty, and I send out different resources and tips throughout the week. So if that's something that you're interested in, join us over there. And last but not least, listen up. The most important thing is to share the Friends in Beauty podcast with your other Friends in Beauty, your family, your friends, Anybody that you think could benefit from the information that is being shared, share, share, share a way to help me grow the Friends in Beauty community. Now, on this episode of the Friends in Beauty podcast, I welcome makeup artist Sam Fine to the Friends in Beauty guest chair. Long before he became a celebrity makeup artist, Sam paid his dues working behind the makeup counter of department stores, an experience he fondly refers to as the real school of beauty. There he came in contact with women from all walks of life that wanted one thing, to look their absolute best. He made it his mission to show them how to accentuate their unique beauty by using colors and shades that would best complement their complexions. But most importantly, he helped them eliminate their doubts and apprehension about applying makeup so that they could achieve dazzling results. Sam's talents and determination has taken him far beyond the makeup counter, making him one of today's most sought after makeup artists. His work has appeared on the covers and pages of Cosmopolitan, Harper's Bazaar, Essence, Vibe, and Marie Claire, and was chosen as the first African-American spokesperson for Revlon and CoverGirl Cosmetics. His work has been and continues to be seen on some of your favorite celebrities, such as Queen Latifah, Kerry Washington, 
Cynthia Erivo, Jennifer Hudson, and supermodels Tyra Banks, Iman, and Naomi Campbell. But it was the experiences from his formative years selling makeup that inspired him to write his first book, Fine Beauty, Beauty Basics and Beyond for African American Women, a how-to guide that highlights his many accomplishments. As follow-up to his best-selling book, Fine Beauty, Sam introduced his first instructional DVD, Fine, The Basics of Beauty. With over 30 years in the industry, Sam shows no signs of slowing down. He continues to be persistent about carving his own path and currently serves as the global makeup ambassador for Fashion Fair Cosmetics. Words really can't express how how much of an honor it was to sit and have this conversation with the Sam Fine. I literally had tears of emotional gratitude after this interview because it was just so surreal for me and just such a full circle moment. I had such a great time, of course, chatting with him. In this interview, Sam shares a glimpse of his 30 plus years in the beauty industry and how he developed his aesthetic, the real behind being a celebrity makeup artist, how to be honest with your clients and manage their expectations, the importance of building and maintaining relationships. He also shared who his dream client is, what it's like working with Fashion Fair, how he stays mentally tough, two major skills beauty pros are lacking to be successful, and he even answered some questions from the friends and beauty community and so much more. Y'all, Sam laid it all out for us. If you were ever seeking validation that you are on the right path, this interview is for you. If you ever needed reassurance that your hard work is not in vain, this interview is for you. Or if you just need a pick me up, this is for you. I'm so grateful to Sam for his honesty and his transparency as I know that his words will resonate and impact so many people. Please share this episode with another friend in beauty and leave a comment to share your takeaways from this chat. Let's go ahead and jump into this amazing conversation with Sam Fine. And if you prefer to watch our gorgeous faces, then tune in on YouTube. Enjoy. Welcome to the Friends of Beauty podcast, Sam. I'm thrilled to be here. One of the first of many of the people you tagged, I'm sure. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I am beyond excited because you have been a part of my makeup journey before I was a makeup artist. My mom saw that I was interested in makeup. She took me to the fashion fair counter, mm -hmm. bought me the Sand Fine DVD that I let somebody borrow and never got it back. But happens. You, have, you have been there since before I was even thinking about becoming a makeup artist. So this is truly like a full circle moment for me. And I'm just so honored to be able to sit down and have a conversation with you. And I with you. I said this earlier when we were, you know, just, just talking amongst ourselves. And when I saw you make the post on Instagram, and you had also attended a class of mine uh, and Rennie Vasquez when we were touring in the D.C. area, um, I always tell people I support people who support me. So I am thrilled to be here with you today. Thank you so much. So before we get into the interview, I want to start off with some icebreakers to get us warmed up and so the okay. Friends and Beauty audience could get to know you outside of beauty. Okay. So the first one, just give us three random facts about Sam Fine. Adopted. Okay. Scorpio. Mm -hmm. And I like red wine. All right. What kind of red wine? Anyone in particular? Barolo. Okay. I love Barolo, that area. It's always the Nebbiolos. Those are great. Really light and not too fruity, but just really smooth. So yeah. th th that's, th those are, that's one of my favorites. Okay. Sounds good. I have these things called pod decks and they okay. have like these random, sometimes crazy, sometimes cool questions in them. This is a what the heck and a would you rather? Which one would you like? What the heck? What the heck? He's going for it. <laughs> I think people go for it too because it's green and green just feels safe, you know. But they say red make well, red makes you hungry. But yeah, you know, the red was like, I don't know. This is a good one. Okay. Describe describe your sense of humor in one word. <laughs> rye. I have a very wry sense of humor. Um, I mean, we could joke. I, I can I can joke about death or 
yeah. or things that aren't often, you know, deemed funny. Right. You know, um, and 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 other things I can say with my friends that seem a bit off kilter, mm -hmm. but I find it hilarious because you're laughing at something that you're not supposed to be laughing. <laughs> right feel a little bit of yeah it makes you it tickles you a little bit yeah because we're not really <laughs> supposed to be saying stuff like this yeah. it's like a joke at a funeral you know <laughs> it's like it's bad taste i know i know but it's really funny i like that okay what's something weird or interesting that you do when no one is watching I'm really kind of stumped because I'm a pretty, you know, open book. Mm -hmm. um, probably, probably clean my house. Okay. After my housekeeper cleans it, I still go back and clean. Okay. So I would hate that she would know that I did that. So I guess that's kind of in secret. I also clean before she comes because mm -hmm. I don't want her to think of me as a messy person. <laughs> so if I had to say something I do that I, that, that I, that other people, you know, I wouldn't want them to see me doing was like cleaning like it's it's a going joke my friends are like oh was your cleaning lady there i was like yeah oh so you're cleaning i was like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah pretty much because i do the, the extra stuff yeah yes okay nothing wrong with that yes okay but i don't want to be perceived as neurotic mm -hmm. and now it's like so you clean before and after the cleaning lady sam mm -hmm. well like you have ocd so yes Okay. What do people always tell you that you're good at aside from what you do professionally, of course? Keeping time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the person who just has a sense of time. I even play a trick with myself sometimes and um, guess the time and I'm usually like a minute or two off. Mm -hmm. I have a very good sense of, of time. They're like, what time is it? I'm like, oh, it's, it's got to be like 2.05. And it'll be like 2.08. Okay. So, so, yeah. Okay. I'm good with time in the sense of like laying out time. Like I know how much time it takes to do certain tasks. So I can really give you an exact time or like when I need to leave, what time I'm going to arrive, what time I need to leave to get to. I'm like really on top of time like that. I hate being late. Like it just boils my blood. Too much stress. What's your sign? I'm an Aquarius. Oh, okay, okay. I don't know many Aquarians, but okay. okay. And that's not really an Aquarius trait either. Right. That's what I was like, hmm. That's not, yeah, but it's just a personal trait, yeah. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. When's the last time that you did something for the first time? <laughs> oh, my God. You know, I, I, there's not much that I haven't done. I'm 53. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, whether it's going to theater or, or, or taking a vacation or hanging out with friends or drinking or, um, I took an edible. Okay. I lived in LA for seven years and now that it's legal, I'm not, a, I'm not a, um, a smoker. And so my friends gave me an edible, we went to theater and uh -huh. I was blasted. I was like, okay. And I only took half, but I mean, it's relative depending on the measurements, but I was like, whoa. That's funny. Would you do it again? You've been there. Would you do it again? At a lesser dosage, yes. Okay. Because I, I'm, I, you know, I'm a drinker. I can drink, you know, wine and, and, and scotch. I love scotch and whiskey, um, but to, to edibles, you can't gauge as much. You can, if anyone out there is drink a drinker, you can tell when you're, you know, when you, when you're feeling the effects, but right. you, you know, you, uh, take an edible, you're, you're just on for the ride. Yeah. Then it's the whole body. Your whole body is feeling it. You gotta and wait the next it. day. Mm -hmm. Okay. The last one, if you weren't a makeup artist, is there anything else that you're passionate about that you could see yourself doing? Teaching. Um, I, uh, you know, I enjoy education. You've attended a class. I really enjoy passing along knowledge. And I had some amazing art teachers when I was in high school. I had an amazing art teacher when I was in uh, a college program and they changed my life forever. And mm -hmm. so I so value what they have given me. And I always said, when I moved to New York, I said, you know what, 
if things don't work out for me, I'll go back to school and be an art teacher. And I know I'll be happy. Yeah, okay. I could totally see that. Right, right, right. You, you like, know how I am in class. You'd be like gray beard. Not today, <laughs> not today. today. But like, you know, in the future. Yes. Oh, no, it ain't the future. It's now, just not today. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. So I would love to just go ahead and jump in. Where are you from? I'm from Chicago. From Chicago, Chicago Illinois, South Side. Okay. And, um, yeah, yeah. The Windy City. Uh, now is not the greatest time to visit. It's always very cold. The winters are brutal. Um, so yeah, but I moved to from I moved from Chicago to New York when I was 17 after I graduated high school. Okay. Did you have any siblings growing up? I have three older sisters. I'm the oh. baby. Oh, that's nice. Okay. How did yeah. you feel um, growing up with three older sisters and being a part of like a blended family, you being adopted? Um, I was adopted when I was six months. Mm -hmm. So I always grew up knowing there was no secret involved. There was no great reveal. Uh, my parents made it very clear that we loved you. We wanted you. And that's why you're here. So I grew up knowing. In fact, I would tell kids in class when I was in grammar school that I was adopted and they would be like, no, you aren't. And I was like, yeah, I am. I think I really, because I was so nonchalant about it because it literally was, it meant nothing to me because mm -hmm. my parents didn't make a big deal out of it. So I didn't make a big deal out of it. Yeah. Um, uh, being the youngest of a female dominated home is interesting. Uh, you know, you wind up having a mother and then three other mothers. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a lot of care growing up, me and my dad, um, would be kind of in the basement doing our own thing. I was drawing, he would do his bills and his electronics. He was into film. Um, so it, it's just interesting because everywhere you go, you're learning about beauty or my sister's crying because it's that time of the month. Yeah. Stuff you just have no idea as a, as a guy about and so in many ways they prepared me for the beauty industry i think because um i'm very sensitive obviously to to women's needs and and what they go through so so i felt like maybe it was a, a training yeah. you know, my training ground yeah you're an outlier yes yes yeah absolutely there is like a whole new generation of artists who do not know who sam fine is I tagged you before. You probably remember me tagging you. I used to teach at um, Bennett Career Institute. Yes, and, yes, yes. Yeah. So I used to have my students do a project um, where they I would just put random names in a in a bowl and had them choose whoever and then do like a research project on them and present it to the class. So a few people have done research projects on you because there's a whole new generation yes, of people yes. who don't you know, like the new generation. So now, like, if you having so many years in the industry, like, how do you introduce yourself when people ask, like, who you are and, like, what do you do? I don't. I tell people all the time I'm a makeup artist. Mm -hmm. Someone once said at a party, it's like, oh, do you work at a cosmetic counter? I was like, no, but I used to. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, I shy, I've shied away from doing the show and tell, uh, well, I work in television and film. I work with celebrity clients. I've written a book. That's, those are my achievements. That's not what I do. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, we're all so similar. Um, our paths may have taken us different places, but it's, I think it's important to remain rooted in the core of what it is we do. Mm -hmm. I'm a makeup artist. I'm a freelancer. I don't work for a television show. I don't work in, I, I, I haven't taken on a movie right now. Um, and it's not relevant. Um, it's not my job to inform the kids of who I am. Hopefully, uh, hopefully they are interested enough to think about the people who came before them. Mm -hmm. I was, I know who Roxana Floyd and Reggie Wells are, Quiet Fire who worked with Whitney Houston. Um, and many, many others um, whose names don't roll off our tongues. Um, I'm very blessed, but at the same, for the same token, I find that uh, you bring up Kevin Aquan or Way Bandy or Fran Cooper or, or, or yeah, the list goes on and on. Just because you're acknowledged by the masses doesn't 
I mean, you're not, just because you're not acknowledged by the masses doesn't diminish your work. Absolutely. And I think that's so important for a lot of artists to know because of the age that we're in with social media, it's almost like social media is like set there to like validate them in their artistry. And a lot of people struggle with that, with if they're not getting the likes or the follows, um, if they only you know, get likes when they do post somebody that is of some significance versus posting a regular client, it can kind of play with your head a little bit to make you feel like it has to be that way. And that's why I'm so blessed to have been born post social media, mm -hmm. post computers. Um, when I came up, in the industry, there was a lot more community because you had to know these people, you had to see these people, um, you had to communicate with beauty editors and magazines. Um, and some of that communication has fallen to, to the wayside because it's so much easier to do it electronically. Yeah. Um, but I do think it's important to know where you came from. There are pioneers in every industry and to be able to know um, you know, some of these amazing artists who didn't have books, who didn't, uh, who weren't on television shows, who weren't um, a part of a reality show. Um, I think it speaks to a real love for the craft and not just um, an interest in becoming famous. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Can you take us through like a, it's so, I know it's hard. How many years have you been in the industry now? <laughs> Gosh, uh, 30 plus is how I say it, because I passed my 30th and I, I stopped counting. But nice. finally, my book it will be 24 in February. Okay, okay. Can you take us through, if you can, like a, a quick like snapshot of your, your highlight reel as a makeup artist? Like you said you came to New York at 17. Um, on my tail, moved back home when I was 18. Mm -hmm. um, had an offer from a small cosmetic line that uh, wanted me to join them, Naomi Sims Cosmetics. Um, moved back to New York when I was 19, and I've been here ever since. Um, I started assisting other artists. Uh, everyone kept saying they saw a talent, you know, in me working at the cosmetic counter. And so a hairstylist, a dear friend of mine, referred me to Frank Cooper. I started assisting Frank Cooper. She introduced me to Kevin Aquan. I started assisting them both. Um, but it was Fran who brought me along on a job that uh, with Patti LaBelle. And so I was working on our background singers and she turned around and saw our background singers and was like, who did Debbie? And so she asked to meet me and then she got my number because uh, Fran wasn't always available to work with her. And the story is very similar with Naomi Campbell. We were working together at a fashion show. I was assisting Fran again. And um, Naomi saw me behind stage working on another model. And I get, I'll i assume that she liked the makeup that I was doing. And uh, she called me at the cosmetic counter on the phone, no cell phones, and um, asked me to work with her for People's 50 Most Beautiful Issue. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I was introduced to Vanessa Williams by her hairdresser. Roberto Leon, um, who thought I would be, make a good addition for Vanessa's busy schedule. Um, she's become my longest running client um, and a dear, dear, dear friend. Um, uh, but it wasn't really, you know, it, it, there was no real jump into makeup artistry stardom at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I was hitting the streets, I was, I was hustling. And I started doing music videos and working with Hype Williams, who was an integral part of my career. At that time, music videos were, you know, interesting to me. But I mean, I, you know, I wasn't working with uh, Vanessa Williams. I didn't do right stuff and, and, and um, those kinds of videos. I was working with Mary J. Blige for her second single. I was working with Brandy on, you know, I want to be down the remix and doing Latifah the first time I met her and Yo-Yo and Light. Yeah. I was working with Deborah Cox on Sentimental. I was working with Faith Evans for her first single, Soon As I Get Home. And these artists weren't established really yet. They had good deals and um, it was just a, a wonderful way to make money. But little did I know that I was laying the foundation for um, 
an impactful career because so much of what was going on then, uh, women of color were looking to music artists for their trends and their beauty um, uh, looks. So I had a wonderful opportunity to spread my wings at the same time that I was um, making inroads at Essence Magazine. Mm -hmm. So Essence Magazine, my first celebrity cover was Jack A. Harry. Um, and then, uh, you know, to go on to do several covers with Mary J. Blige, um, Vanessa Williams, several covers, uh, Gabrielle Union, they introduced me to Monique and Anita Baker. Um, so, so there are lots of steps. Um, and during that time, I was working with Naomi Campbell. Uh, I also met Iman through Essence Magazine. She mm -hmm. was launching her cosmetic line and they teamed us up together to work on her um, feature, her feature story. Uh, and that was wonderful. At the same time, I was still testing, putting pictures in my book, and somebody told me about this model. They were shooting for a spec, and it was Tyra Banks. So you got to be in it to win it. Yeah. And so there's never one moment. At that same time, I was working with Veronica Webb. Uh, she had just been signed to be the first African-American uh, model signed to a cosmetic contract and brought me along with her. And it wasn't long after that, I became the first African-American spokesperson for Revlon. Um, Tyra was hired to cover girl. Uh, Queen Latifah was hired to cover girl. I became a cover girl spokesperson and, and many, many will remember my cover girl commercial with Queen Latifah. Mm -hmm. um, later years, I courted fashion fair because I heard that they were under new management. Um, only years later, uh, did they actually reach out to me to hire me as their first creative makeup director, um, and so on and so on and so on. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's never one big break. It's a crack and then another crack and then another crack. And then at some point the wall has to break. I love that analogy so much. Okay. So how does the vision that you had for your career in the beginning compare to how it turned out now? Did you dream as big as how you've gotten or was it smaller? I never had any idea uh, that I would become a makeup artist. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a really fun job. My parents, um, even as I was an artist, um, a fine artist all my life, I never realized that this would be something that I could have as a career. Um, my dad's an electrician, my mother's a homemaker, and I did not think that this was something that I could do until I moved to New York and saw all of what was going on behind the scenes. And just, you know, and my talent was acknowledged in makeup. And so I just wrote it out. Um, I have a very, very strong sense of what I want to see. As, as an artist, I, I've developed that muscle a long time ago, so I can draw it out, I can sketch it for you, um, I can storyboard it for you. If you like, I, I, I had that vision, and so it's that vision that I brought to makeup artistry. Mm -hmm. um, so imagine in my head seeing a face chart all the time. So yeah. I'm thinking, how can this happen? How can I add placement and do things differently and get them ready for this. Um, and that's just one of my gifts. So I had no idea that I would reach this level of success because, but I just continued to show up for it and be prepared. And you know what they say about preparation meeting um, opportunity. So. Yeah. I love that so much. And I also feel like a lot of the artists that like I admire or have taken classes from or learn from come from the same fine lineage. So I feel like our <laughs> aesthetics, we use our little sponges. Yes, and yes. Our aesthetics are kind of simi similar or mimic yours to a sense. So would you attribute your, your aesthetic, I, I guess, to being a fine artist? Or how did you develop your sure. aesthetic that you have now? I remember drawing Diana Ross and Vanessa Williams in high school. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so sad that my parents, you know, they moved. When I moved to New York, they moved into another home. And uh, it's unfortunate that they, you know, tossed a lot of stuff. I, you know, I still have a lot of my illustrations, but I remember drawing some of these beautiful women. And I remember drawing out Iman from the fashion magazines and watching her on the runway. 
um, it's just, it's, it's, it's a dream come true when all of these things really connect. Um, so I do attribute much of my success to my artistic background for sure. Um, I tell people all the time that what's the difference between drawing a brow and drawing lip liner and contouring and highlighting. I have a blank canvas literally that I have to bring these things to. So doing it on a three dimensional, you know, moving, moving figure um, is more challenging. And I had to learn that, mm -hmm. but it's still very similar. It's part of, it's part of a part of what I learned as an artist for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I know you're a busy man. So like, what is a typical <laughs> week in the life look like for you? Are you always on the go? Like always mm -hmm. working or do you have any downtime? I tell people all the time that, you know, there are lulls mm -hmm. to your work. So it's like when you look at the red carpet and you're like, Beyonce's not doing anything. Okay, so if I'm Beyonce's makeup artist, what would I be doing? Right. So I'd be, you know, away from her at that time. Fortunately, I made a career working with a number of women and I diversified. So if I'm not with Gabrielle Union, I'm with Queen Latifah. If I'm not with Queen Latifah, I'm with Vanessa. If I'm not with Vanessa, I'm with Cynthia Erivo. Um, you have to, you know, make sure to not hedge your bets, but stay connected to everyone that you can so that when that celebrity is not in season or working or doesn't have a project to promote, that you can stay busy. And if, if it happens that you, you know, all of your girls are down, then you write a book, you work on something, you work on your portfolio, you work on the things that you would like to happen. Yeah. And so that that's where Fine Beauty was born for, you know, around a, um, a time in my 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 career where I was I was kind of, you know, right here. You know, I'd reached a certain level and I wanted it to grow and I wanted to think about what's next for myself. And so I, I, I wrote Fine Beauty. Um, but honestly, a day in the life, I mean, it can be anywhere. I just left, um, working with her, uh, Gabriella Wilson for Beauty and the Beast, the live action, uh, celebration, uh, 30th, 30th, uh, celebration of Beauty and the Beast. And that was lovely. It was a first time working with her, um, 25 year old consummate professional, um, such a talent and what a joy to work with. So, you know, being uh, in a union member who's in film and television, who also is a freelancer, there are more opportunities because once again, you have to diversify. When things get quiet, I can always go to a television show and work or think about a project coming up that's a lot more long-term than the short-term uh, bookings that, that freelance offer. Yes. So you're constantly thinking about what's next um, but now after the holidays, this is January, 2023, and I'm unemployed mm -hmm. freelancers as, as many freelancers are when they aren't working. So I'm thinking about who's going to call next. And I just got a call from Gabrielle Union. I just got a call from Queen Latifah about possibly going to the Grammys. So it just depends on what's going on that day and also what I want to work on. Um, we into tax season. That was a beast. Yeah. Um, you want to plan a vacation. So everything isn't work. Um, I feel like work has its place nowadays. And I don't always have to force myself to do things to make myself feel that being busy is also winning. Mm -hmm. I think rest is winning. Yes. I love me a good nap. Baby. I love you. Good night. Can you speak to like the pros and cons of being with celebrities or being considered a celebrity artist? Because I feel like a lot of people now, they want to be celebrity artists, like straight out the gate. And they don't know what really comes with that. They just want the fame or the, the recognition, I guess, the, the praises from their family because it looks good. It is an easy in. It's an easy way to be celebrated. Mm -hmm. I didn't work with Patti LaBelle to be celebrated. I worked with her because we met at a time where she needed an artist and I was able to bring things to her that she hadn't had before. 
times were changing. She was wearing red lipstick. She wasn't really wearing a lash in the way that she was before. And so to be able to come in and do these brows and to, and to do all of these things, is it's divine timing. Um, I have never wanted to work with someone because they're famous. Mm -hmm. I wanted to work with them because I thought they look like someone who would like my idea of beauty. Yeah. So there's no, there's no, you know, there's no coincidence that I've worked with Vanessa Williams and Halle Berry and Iman and Tyra and Naomi um, and Monique, who I think is absolutely gorgeous. Um, you attract who you are. Yeah. And for me, it's work. So although I am acknowledged as a celebrity artist or how I describe it, a celebrated artist because of my achievements, I still have to go through the same things. That doesn't mean Iman's not gonna cuss me out. That does not mean that Dana, Queen Latifah is going to give me um, three hours to have my way with her face. Mm -hmm. It just means that I get the call. Yeah. And that I have to learn how to work with each talent so differently and learn their, their personalities and learn how to maneuver and manipulate product to get them to where they want to be ultimately. We're servants, yeah. you know? So the, the, there's no downside, but to be honest, you can't please everyone. So to think that just because I'm a great makeup artist that I can, I, anyone can be my client, I don't believe that. Mm -hmm. There are certain people who don't believe in what I believe in. I am not going to apply concealer under a brow and go over it in the top. That's not how I work. You've been to my class. Mm -hmm. I have a much more subtle way of doing beauty, um, of seeing faces. And I've watched how things have changed and I'm inspired by it all. But I also know what works for me. Right. And I also know what works for my clients. So I don't try to, to turn into someone else because of what is happening mm -hmm. in, in mainstream. I will pull, cherry pick things. But I mean, you're talking about like the brow, the concealer around the brow. I'm known for doing brows, quite outstanding brows. So I don't see why I would need to change that to make it harder on myself, actually. Right, just because it's trendy. Because it's trendy. Mm -hmm. So I have a very clear sense of who I am um, as a person and as an artist. And because I work with celebrities doesn't make me successful. It makes me simply have another client in my chair. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love that. I love that. But I, I also feel like we're in an era where like the celebrity artist is like a celebrity. Has it always been like that? I feel like celebrity makeup artists, like when you see them, they just have this this aura about them like they're celebrities too <laughs> i think there's a difference between i mean you've seen me in class and i dress up and i groom and you know i always wear something special um but when i go to work i look just like you mm -hmm. um, you know it's wonderful to be celebrated and to have the opportunity to dress up and you know go to a black tie event or a company mon to uh, an event or go with Tyra to the Essence Awards or things of that nature. That's, that's, I call that, I call those perks. Yeah. But that's Cinderella. That's, I gotta come home and clean. <laughs> and I might have to work the next day. So I, I have seen some artists who hold themselves in that celebrity way. Um, that's not something that I really, can relate to. Mm -hmm. When I think of Sir John or Valente Frazier or Ernesto Casillas, um, and, you know, if I see them dressed up at an event, we're all on par. We're just, we just put on our finest to come out. Okay. Um, there's nothing different, so different about us and so above other artists, because at the end of the day, we will all be on our knees doing body makeup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay?
I love that. But it's like, you don't really see it. That's probably why. You just see them with the glitz and glamour and then you don't really see the dirty work. Of... But isn't that true of every celebrity we know? Mm -hmm. um, we don't watch, we don't know them going through the divorce. We don't know them um, as mothers and as children of parents uh, as well. So we all have a lot more in common. I think that that's the one thing about working with celebrities that, you know, it's it's great, but you learn to really see them through a very different lens. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I'm starstruck. You know, working with Janet Jackson or 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 Jesse Norman or Aretha Franklin. Obviously, I'm starstruck, but at the same time, we're here to do a job. Mm -hmm. She may be nervous too about the performance. She may be, you know. Uh, you know, feel out of sort because of the baby weight that she's she's gained and hasn't gotten rid of yet, yeah. and being judged on a thousand a thousand uh, um, pages now, as opposed to being on one red carpet and it trickling down to the magazines. Now you're caught at every angle and dissected as well. Yeah. So I couldn't imagine being them either. Crazy, crazy. Oh my gosh. So we're gonna play Never Have I Ever. <laughs> he's already sipping so I have a never have I ever statement for you if this has happened to you you can share the story behind it and if it hasn't happened how would you advise another makeup artist to deal with this kind of situation okay so never have I ever had a client not be satisfied with the makeup that I've done have you has that ever happened to you before absolutely Hey, I know you're enjoying the episode, but I have something to tell you real quick. Did you know that I created a Patreon? Look, podcasting is fun. I absolutely love it, but it is not cheap. And there have been so many people who have reached out to me that want to support the show somehow and keep the good vibes flowing. So I thought, why not create a Patreon for as little as $3 a month? You can support the Friends of Beauty podcast and join a community of other loyal supporters of the show just like you, okay? There are other tier levels available that unlock tons of exclusive Patreon-only content like behind-the-scenes clips, bonus interview content, monthly calls with me, discounts, and so much more. But no matter what tier level you decide to choose, I appreciate you so much, and I'm going to give you a shout out on the podcast when you join. So if you'd like to be a part of the exclusive Patreon community for the Friends of Beauty podcast, I'll leave the link right here and down below in the show notes for you to join. And as always, I appreciate your support so, so much. Now, let's go ahead and jump back into the episode. Um, in fact, I... Gosh, I'm trying to think of which story that I know. <laughs> when I was a very young makeup artist, I was working with Suzanne DePass of Motown fame. Mm -hmm. And I was recommended to her and I put on a foundation. I was using a liquid foundation. I was still working behind the counter. So I wasn't quite the professional who had a kit and really had a, um, a choice, a selection and knew how to wield my products well. And I was applying this makeup and it just didn't look good. And I asked her if she minded taking it off, um, that I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I didn't like how it looked on her and I didn't like the, the color and the lack of dimension. Um, and I, that just meant that I had some studying to do. Um, it's funny because Iman, I was getting her ready for the CFDA award. She was um, going to receive an award as a fashion icon. And that night, couldn't have been better. And she asked me, she said, you know, Sam, can you put a little gold like in the inner corner? And I did too much to her. Oh no, it's wrong. Oh, this is oh, it's horrible. I was like, you know, I can fix this. Oh, do it. And so I fix it and it's like nothing ever happened. Mm -hmm. You have to know how to steady yourself in those situations. There isn't much I can't do. And if there's something that you want, all you have to do is ask for it. Yeah. But most of the time, the people we're working on also have nerves and they, they have a way and they, they're managing something too. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I remember that and I don't go off, I don't have a fit, 
because most things can be fixed. Mm -hmm. If we just sit together and work as a team, it'll be okay. Yeah. Absolutely. I had, well, I don't really have, well, I'm lucky enough not to have that many people that tell me that they don't like their makeup. But one time I had a lady actually like take a wipe and like wiped it off. And I thought that was very rude because it wasn't like I was a baby makeup artist. I had been doing makeup for some time and I asked her what she wanted. I gave her what she asked for and she looked in the mirror <laughs> It did not like it at all. And she was like, can I see the wipe? And I thought she was just going to like clean up something. Right, she right, right. Wiped her face. And I was just like, what? And it was for an event. It was for um the Women's March that was here in D.C. like some years ago. And uh, yeah, that was that was a very interesting situation. But the coordinator for us, she was like, come here. She was like, there was nothing wrong with her makeup. She's just nervous. Like she has a lot of pressure on her and she just you know, has a lot going on. And I was like, okay, but my feelings were hurt. I was like, whoa, uh, I had never had anybody do that to me before. I have not had that happen, but I have done what I think to be some of my best work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for whatever reason, it just doesn't work out. Sometimes it's just personalities. Yeah. Sometimes someone else can get away with something that you can't. Mm -hmm. You know, I bleached, I bleached Vanessa Williams' eyebrows. I talk about this all the time. It was not a good day. And so the time I chose to be different and unique, it was not good. Okay. And I'm fortunate, I will say this to your story, I'm fortunate that it was Iman and Vanessa and that they still trusted and saw something in me that I could improve. Mm -hmm. I think it's short-sighted for people to deem you untalented or unworthy or I'm going to wipe my whole makeup off. And I do understand that some people are learning. Um, I hope that they're honest with their clients and saying, I've never used this before, or I want to try something new on you because you have to bring them along the journey with you. Yeah. you. You know, nobody's perfect. If I'm just starting out and using a, a new foundation, I got to be real about that, because if it backfires on me, it's going to look as if I knew what I was doing and it just didn't pay off. Mm -hmm. And I love that advice. And I love that it's coming from you for people to see that even Sam Fine, you know, has his moments because there are a lot of artists out there who feel like if I tell my client, I don't like the way this looks, they're not going to see me as a professional. If I, if I mess up or something, or if I tell them, you know, like if I try to bring them along on this journey with me, they're going to think that I don't know, you know, what I'm doing. You know what I love? You know, I have a pet peeve and you'll get this analogy. I hate it when waiters act like they've worked here forever and you're new. If you say you're new, yeah. how much more patience am I going to afford you? Exactly. All I want to know, oh my God, I have this new foundation. I really want to try it out. I want to see how it wears. This, this appearance isn't one of the most important. So let's just try it out and see how it wears. Or, or, or something along the way that, that takes some of the pressure off of you. I think the pressure of perfection is what puts us in a position of, oh, you like this? No, but if I would have told you when I was doing it that I didn't like it, right. look how we would have worked to resolve this. Mm -hmm. I had to tell Queen Latifah, I've got to take this lash on you, off of you. It did not place right. It's, let me say this and everybody hear me loud and clear. Makeup is not an exact science. Like cooking. Yep. Cooks are off. Your swing, your placement, the lighting, your anxiety, their anxiety are all elements that can change the ultimate outcome. Yep. So I tell people all the time, like, it's not exact science. It's not a Lego kit. <laughs> so if I do, if I can call it, then kudos to me for at least saying it before you had to say it to me. Right. Yes. Kudos to you. <laughs> You've done a lot of people in the industry, though. Is there anybody who you haven't done yet who you feel like your beauty philosophy would translate onto? No. Yes. <laughs> I, you know what it is? There are a lot of people that I could have seen myself working for. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but for whatever, for whatever reason, we haven't connected. Yeah. And I think sometimes that is a universe, that is God putting people or pulling them out of your path. Yeah. Um, I was, I've been so blessed to work with Eartha Kitt and Aretha Franklin and Gladys Knight and Shaka Khan, Patti LaBelle, that do I really need to chance it with Diana Ross? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you just, but I'm saying you, sometimes you, you, you can push it too far where you end up in a space that's not for you. Mm-hmm. And don't ever force your hand. Don't ever try to make someone love you, make someone work for you, make something. You can't make fetch happen. Yeah, stop trying to make fetch happen. <laughs> Yo, you cannot, you cannot. There are some people who are going to love you for an eternity, mm-hmm. who will speak your name long after you're gone. And then there's some people who are just like, oh, that was nice. It wasn't transformative. Mm-hmm. Um, I've worked on clients who obviously have worked with Kevin Aquan and have been able to, to relay stories to me like, wow, I just didn't feel a good fit there. And like how that made me think about somebody saying that about me can't be for everybody. Right. You can't. Mm-hmm. You just cannot. There are certain people who get you. Even when I refer a client to someone else, I'm like, I prepare them for it, but there's certain people who are literally your face. Mm-hmm. You know, I think of Scott Barnes and J-Lo. Mm-hmm. I think of, you know what I'm saying? There are people, I think of Reggie Wells and Oprah. I think of Derek Rutledge and Oprah. I think of Roxana Floyd and Whitney Houston and Quiet Fire and Whitney Houston. These are matches that, you, these are matches of makeup artists and celebrity that come together in a way that I wouldn't know how to see them if yeah. I didn't see them through this lens. Right, right, yeah. Totally get that. It's, the, it's divine. They just, they just totally. Fit. Kevin Aquan doing Janet Jackson for If. Come on. Oh my God. You, you, you can't, you can't think of a better combination. Mm-hmm. It is divine timing, and it is so meant to be. It is so meant to be. Yeah, I love that. How has building genuine relationships contributed to your success in the industry? Because Friends and Beauty was built on networking. That's how Friends and Beauty started as networking events. And then we transitioned into podcasting. And I just love meeting people. And everything that I've done that is like, I guess, notable, I don't even know the word, in the industry has literally come from networking. Me meeting somebody, kind of like when you said you assisted and then things kind of trickled. Mm -hmm. I assisted Morel and worked with Danessa very early in my Uh career. And then everything else kind of branched off from being associated with them. Yes. So how has relationships contributed to you and your success? I mean, Frank Cooper introduced me to so many. My, my best friend, one of my dearest, closest friends was my mentor in makeup and helped to train me, tra- train me as a fine artist and translate that ability to makeup artistry. Um, I love my community. If you guys have ever seen me at IMATS or when you came to the class in the DMV, um, Derek Rutledge came to say hello. Yeah. Um, Jackie Aina has come to classes of ours. Um, I love my community and because I feel that we're all cut from the same cloth. We do things a little differently. We may want different things from it, but ultimately we're doing the same job. Um, I have, I mean, you know, Vanessa Williams, former hairdresser introduced me to Vanessa. I think that the real comment about these introductions is I never wanted to disappoint them. Yeah. I wanted to show up and be prepared and be able to do amazing work. So I don't take referrals. I don't take um, recommendations lightly. Um, I work very hard to make sure to show up uh, when people put their neck on the line. Um, I've also been fortunate enough to recommend other artists and other hairstylists and other stylists to clients, other photographers um, to to them. So people's word, I I feel like that's all you have. 
-hmm. So the minute someone refers you to someone or you're referred by them, the, the expectation, my expectation of myself is to blow it out of the water, to be everything plus what you've expected, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. okay I, I totally agree with that if somebody recommends me I gotta be I gotta go above and beyond I gotta be early I gotta go oh no, come on I gotta be like I just gotta you can be late on your time this is oh Sam recommended you he didn't tell me you were gonna be late <laughs> oh I'll be mortified I just I would quit make it. <laughs> and you have to kind of you have to kind of know that we're always standing on someone's shoulders so if I'm asking for you to assist or if I'm looking for you to work with a client of mine, I've taken lots of care and consideration in walking you through the process, the do's and don'ts. Make sure to sanitize your hands. If you're a smoker, make sure to wash your hands before you come to this person. She's very sensitive to this. Oh, you might have a mask on because she's kind of germaphobic because, you know, they're, they, they deal with this and this and this. There are always a list of things to help to make your job easier. Yeah, you know, so so um, yeah, I, th I I think it's important to just really take seriously these recommendations and these referrals because there's a lot riding on it more than has to do with you. Absolutely, I totally agree. So, Sam, what does it mean to be a global makeup ambassador? Like, what did what do you do? I mean, you know, uh, when I worked when I returned to Fashion Fair. I enjoyed being a creative makeup director actually more because I was able to oversee a number of things. Fashion Fair, of course, was born on the runway of Fashion Fair's traveling show. So when I first uh, joined Fashion Fair as creative makeup director, I was able to go in the closets, pull vintage Bob Mackie, um, um, uh, just Saint Laurent, like beautiful, beautiful clothes. And there were so many great memories that gave me an opportunity to really play off of. So in the first ad that I did for Fashion Fair, I was able to select the, the, the photographer, select the creative team, mm -hmm. um, choose the model, of course, and select some of the, the stylists, but also making sure that stylists had clothing from the Fashion Fair runway, which I thought was the DNA of the brand. Um, it gives me more scope to do presentations, to do um, pitches to people who can make fetch happen. Yes. So if you want a red lipstick collection, well, I get to present it in all its many forms. Mm -hmm. I get to pitch a new eyeshadow collection. I also have the, um, the, the, the joy of being able to uh, have my first co-branded collection, Sam Fine for Fashion Fair. So it's those things that change from being a spokesperson to being a valued creative makeup director because they get a chance to use all of your sensibilities, all of your talents, mm -hmm. you know, instead of just one. I love that. I love that. How did you maintain that relationship over the years? Because let me tell you, when they, when Fashion Fair went out of business, I was like, I know they better um, open up that warehouse so we can get Cola and Sable. Yes. <laughs> so we can at least get the powders. Come on. Oh, I know. I think they may be gone forever unless they, they bring back some of the heritage shades. Um, we have to be prepared for newness. Um, I kept up a great relationship with Desiree Rogers who was the CEO then, and then became the owner of Fashion Fair and Black Opal. Uh, we, reunite, we, we reunited um, at the beginning of the launch. So I helped to do some color analysis around the stick foundations, the cream, the powders, submitted some of my um, thoughts on a new foundation for the brand, because you get a chance to have a conversation with people that is much more valuable to me than artistry. Mm -hmm. um, I can always make Kiki Lane look amazing. And in fact, for the the ads, she wanted to use um, Kita Moore, uh, Kill Pretty, who I'm a huge fan of. So it was wonderful to be able to direct and move the show, make sure we got our deliverables um, and work with Desiree hand in hand, as opposed to having to uh, do makeup watch the model, help to get what I wanted on screen, right. 
it, it, it helps to separate your talents yeah. and maintaining relationships is important. Um, you can leave, but you don't have to cuss nobody out when you leave. Mm -hmm. And so when I left as creative makeup director of two years, um, it, it still had room for me to return in the same way that I was a cover girl spokesperson. Uh, I was able to return when Queen Latifah uh, had Queen Collection. Yeah. So, you know, you want to do the best you can at keeping those relationships um, cordial. Yeah. So that if and when you need to return or even need advice, uh, it's, it's, it's a great way to, to um, leave those doors open. Mm -hmm. you know? You know? Yeah, things like being a global makeup ambassador or creative director, are those jobs that you can apply to? Or is it like the brand knows who San Fine is or knows who Kill Pretty is and decides to reach out to them to bring them on board? The latter. Um, you want someone who has the pulse. When I think of Priscilla Ono uh, working with Fenty, mm -hmm. when I think of Peter Phillips working at Dior, um and chanel uh these are people who have put their work in front of a community that and celebrities that is usually well received so the cosmetic company thinks and they believe that you have your finger on the pulse you know you're you know kill pretty's working with uh um gosh uh janelle monet and Issa ray and Fantasia, and so they're launching something that's they want to speak to those, 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 those women in those complexion range, and who's better to hire than the artist who's creating those looks? Right. Makes so sense. I think it's it's kind of challenging for general market brands, uh, the Lauders, the Dior's, the Chanel's, to align themselves with with artists of color because their business isn't built on that. Mm -hmm. But women of color, uh, aside from Latinos and Asian community, um, which obviously there's a different language, there is always a language to beauty from the way that we are brought up, brought up in our communities into what the way we like things and the way we pair things together. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important to have spokespeople at every company of different races. I think many of the brands have a lot of catching up to do. I mean, you know, they're, they're quick to do color extensions, but they're not quick to hire a spokesperson who can explain the real differences in these formulas and explain the differences in how we achieve this shade extension. Um, and those are the kind of things that bring uh, consumers to the counter. It's not just enough to have a spokesmodel anymore, to look at Joan Joan, um, top model Joan or, or Leah Cabede front the brand or Zoe Kravitz for Yves Saint Laurent. I don't think it's enough to have them as a part of the brand. I think it's important, more important for them to have specific outreach. And when I say specific outreach, that means having a spokesperson that we all relate to. Many of the spokespeople for these brands, we don't know because they don't speak to us. Right. So I think it's it's a trickle down. It's not just the product, it's not just the model. It is engagement with the community and that that is lacking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of efforts, um, at least over the pandemic, it seemed like it really, really revved up with getting inclusion in certain areas of the industry, especially with like TV and film and having those artists on set and, but that was really a part of the Black Lives Matter movement okay. and companies like Beauty, um, Black Beauty Roster yeah. and starting these organizations that, you know, even having Sephora uh, give, uh, do the Sephora pledge, which is 15% of their brands, they will bring in that are Black owned. So mm -hmm. yeah, now you see Fashion Fair at Sephora. Now you see Danessa Myricks at Sephora. Now you see Ami... Uh, Cole at Sephora because of this pledge, but it's only when we stand together and use our voice collectively that we can really make a change. Absolutely. I, and I look forward to seeing it play out for sure. I, I think it's going to be interesting. Only time will tell.
Only time will tell, yes. What is something that you do every day that contributes to like your personal growth or just staying like mentally tough or just mentally just in a good place in this crazy world that we're in? I mean, I I went back to seeing a therapist um, after COVID and to be able to check in with someone. And I love Michelle Williams. I love check in um, that term because you have to know how to check in with friends, with your tribe, with people you can share insecurities and lack around um, without judgment. Um, going back to therapy helped tremendously for me to remember. I can tell you today that I'm unemployed, but after 30 years, having been in this same situation, I know that the phone always rings. I have to pull that belief back up and that belief is within you, obviously, because I'm going to speak fact. I've been hired. A new job just came up. A new opportunity just came up. So all I have to do is, is, is remember. Mm -hmm. It's always been good. And it has been. It has been. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. I go to therapy, too. It's been helping. Because <laughs> really what people think like, I'm not working through problems. Obviously, there are problems to work through. And yes, I do. But I go to remember what's on the other side yes. of this problem. There's nothing so great that I can't relax, that that, can't, that problem can't be happen, can be happening. And I can also find joy at the same time. Mm -hmm. They're not mutually exclusive. I think that people think time, like I had a great time during COVID and I wasn't making no money. Right. Because it was, it, I enjoyed that pause. It was necessary. It was yeah. necessary for us all to sit still. Um, so someone might have seen it as a problem that I wasn't making money, that I didn't have money coming in, that I didn't know where my next job was going to come from or what that would look like. Or I can remember what I've always known. And I've always, always been taken care of. Mm. Yes, that faith. You got to have faith. It's a choice. It is a choice. It mm. is a choice. Absolutely. What are some of the soft skills that you see, I guess, makeup artists or industry professionals lacking in order to be successful? Timeliness. Timeliness. Being early is on time. Mm hmm uh, I got that from RuPaul, um, and it's so true. If I'm 15 minutes early, then you're already late. And I think that's something that you can take throughout your, your life. Um, I love being able to be, you know, to get somewhere and to, you have to realize, you know this as an artist, every environment. Can you imagine everyone who's watching who may work at home and or go to an office, can you imagine every time you go to work, it's a different space? Right. And you have to acclimate to that. The bed is in the way at the hotel. If we could just get rid of this bed, you know, this would be amazing. Yeah. I could spread out. We could put the table here. Um, just trying to work through those logistics, the light, it's rainy today. I had to bring my light with me. Um, and setting up is, and, and, and preparing and being on time, I think is a huge, um, part of showing up aside from the talent that you bring. Mm -hmm. Um, I also think that a lot of people fail in management, asking for rates, asking for certain type of treatment. Um, it's not about what you're worth. It's about what you've experienced prior to that and what you want for your life. How can you make sense of this? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've done many talks about rates and travel and per diem and things of that nature. Before you get to an agent, you should be able to negotiate these things for yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm just not good at that. Well, you're going to have to become good at that. Or even your agent isn't going to know how to manage you because they won't know how to manage your expectations. Yeah. That's and my expectations may not be conveyed 
And then now I'm mad at you because, oh, you, you agreed to this rate. But if I told them that this was my rate and this is what I want, I, now, now, now we have to be in agreement. Mm -hmm. And I think that changes the conversation considerably. Um, I think that a lot of artists imagine that people do their job. Your job is everybody's job. If that means that I'm working with a hairstylist in daylight and there's no mirror, at some point I'm saying to the hairdresser and the client, like, do you guys want to take a break and just look in a mirror real quick? You know, because it's going to be bringing ease to everyone. Mm -hmm. Trying to get this part straight in the middle while I'm trying to do makeup, that's not going to work either. Mm -hmm. So let me find a way. And so it's all your job. It's all your job, the financials. It's all your job about, hey, you know, um, uh, did we send a book? Did we call this person? Do they know that I'm going to be in L.A.? It's all your problem. So stop separating yourself as an artist from your manager, from your accountant, from your PR agency, from any of this. It's all yours. Mm -hmm. And I love that you mentioned the timeliness and just being able to communicate your needs because I just put out an episode yesterday about how our, like how the things that, how can I describe it? So basically how the habits that, that we, that are associated with our, our character, the person that we are, the person that people know us to be, mm -hmm. how is that affecting your business? If you're known to be the person that is passive or um, you don't like confrontation, or if you're known to be the person who was always late, like how is that translating over to your business? So being in a position where you recognize that and you work on that because it's going to spill over eventually, if it's not already, like the people that are always late, eventually people are late for friends and they're also late for work yeah but eventually people are going to get note that this makeup artist is always late we're not going to hire her or him and then your your phone lines the dms and everything is dry because word then got out and i can't tell you how many people it puts at ease mm -hmm. they get to see me there sometimes i'm there early enough where queen latifah is like i can't find this location can you pin it yeah I sure can i'm in the trailer Boom, you're an asset. You're adding value, not to your craft, but being there. And I think that that is pivotal for a lot of people who understand that this is a business. Um, I haven't always been this way. There have been many times where I have, you learn from these experiences where I didn't do my taxes for multiple years. And then once it creeps up on you and it is really a problem, now you've really got something to tackle. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times I'm not telling people to be perfect. I'm saying them to tackle the things that they know they lack. If you are if you are someone who is passive and, well, my agent, they said this was all that they had. What else can I have than if I agreed to this rate? Can I get payment the same day? Can they do cars to and from? Can I uh, get a photo or ask for sponsorship? from a company that may boost the money that I'm getting from this, what can I ask of them to, to do too? So it goes both ways and you have to be creative, but you can't wait for someone to bring that to you. You have to be creative and think about that as well. I think that many times we have such great expectations of agents and mentors and, and uh, people in our tribe where sometimes we have to go outside of that and do something different. Mm -hmm. Think differently, if you, especially if you want different results. Absolutely. Oh, that was great. Oh, okay. I hope y'all caught that. Replay it if you didn't. I have to ask, I have promised my friends in beauty, I would ask their questions. Bring on it on. Behalf. So the first question is from Mackenzie. At Concept Kinsey on Instagram, she says, do you have any tips for booking A-list clients? I mean, nowadays, so much work is done through DMs, through, uh, you know, uh, PR. Um, it depends on what market you're in as well. Mm -hmm. um, there are not a, a lot of celebrities 
in the flyover states as there are in New York and LA. So you've got to think about where you are. And the term celebrity is relative. So there may be a newscaster who's very popular in Chicago that I would love to have worked with. Um, uh, you know, Oprah was in Chicago. Uh, she was she was AM Chicago before she was the Oprah Winfrey show. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about how you're going about it, but you guys have technology that joins you in a way that we didn't when I was growing up. So you have a multitude of opportunities. If you really want to work with someone, send them, send them a gift. Send them a few beauty products that you think would make a difference. Hey, I noticed your brows, um, you know, could use this brow gel and it's one of my favorite products. Maybe I'll get a chance to show it to you one day when we work together. Mm -hmm. I like that. That's cute. It doesn't have to be a sell. It can just be, I just want you to know we're going to meet. I love your work. And here's something to add to your beauty regimen. I like that. I like that idea. It is very, um, it doesn't feel like, you know. Who doesn't want to work with Oprah? Who doesn't want to work with, with fill in the blank? How you come to meet them, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe you want, might want to assist her artist. So the times when she's not available, that, that artist, he or she is not available, that maybe you can fill in. There are a hundred ways, you know, and I, I guess I know that the question's kind of one note, but it really speaks to what are your goals? Do you want to work with celebrities? Are you not working with celebrities? It's just really interesting. And I think that a lot of folks really hold celebrities so high as if that is the pinnacle of success. It is not. It is just one surefire way for me to grow my following and me to be recognized more for my work through the celebrities that I work with. Mm -hmm. But I will say this and, and quote me, there are a lot of fantastic several celebrity artists who don't have Instagram, who aren't on social media, who do not have large followings and they've been working for years so mm -hmm. be very clear about what it is you want and why you want it mm -hmm. yeah i like that marlisa at marlisa cornish your beauty i hope i said her last name right because girl i never knew how to pronounce your last name but it's marlisa <laughs> hey girl hey <laughs> i hope it's cornature she, she said, got it <laughs> she said no question just tell him i love him and i've always admired his work like for real for real that's marlisa <laughs> Yes. At Go to Serenity asks, what's the best liner for your waterline and tips to keep eyeliner on? Well, eyeliner travels because outside of this area because of moisture. So if you're not using a setting powder, you don't even have to wear a concealer or foundation to set the area with powder. In fact, I have some powder on now. So imagine eyeliner is a wax and oil even though it's in a stick. So it's gonna warm up with your body heat. It's traveling because you've done nothing to set it. Powder is to, to uh, the skin what top coat is to nail polish. So it holds it in place and, keep, and forms a barrier uh, so that it doesn't travel, right? Um, a good pencil, Victoria Beckham has a beautiful black pencil. It glides on with such ease. Also, I've been, um, I've picked up uh, NARS pencil. Um, I've been picking up a lot of black pencils because the one that I used to use was discontinued. So uh, Victoria Beckham, um, Makeup Forever has a really great pencil. Their pencils are really good and long lasting. Um, but yeah, those are, those are a few options. But you know, it's, it's as we all know, it's trial and error and changing the way that you know, we do makeup sometimes. Adding one product can change the entire look of mm -hmm. makeup. So if that powder near the eyes and say you don't wear makeup, that's okay. You can still wear powder without applying a concealer or foundation. Right. Go to Serenity also asks, is there a best primer for oily eyelids? It's so funny because I don't use primer, but I heard Urban Decay has a bomb. They have so many variations of their primers. Mm -hmm. um, 
I don't really come in contact with that a lot uh, because eyeshadow is a powder. So if you're using eyeshadow, it's rare that the eye is so oily. I don't apply moisturizer or any other product to the eyelid. Um, I may use a little bit of foundation, what's left over in the sponge, just to give it a little of the same texture as, as the other skin so it grabs. Yeah. But, but eyeshadow is a powder. And so that should help to dry out the eye, but you can also take that same loose powder or pressed powder and go over the eyelid to dry it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Those are all the questions. Thank y'all for submitting your questions. I appreciate it. I hope that you got your answer. Definitely <laughs> uh, shout out Sam and repost if you do. So Sam, what do you want your legacy to be for the beauty industry or just globally in general? Um, whenever I've met someone who has my book, or meet a makeup artist at Sephora, or MAC, or any cosmetic counter, or at a class, and they say that I'm the reason that they fell in love with makeup. That is my legacy. I would like to think that I've given so many black and brown kids the ability to see themselves as spokespeople as celebrity artists because when i grew up you had to work with white artists to be recognized mm -hmm. and so when i dedicated my career to beautifying women of color i'd like to say that it it changed how we were all seen you didn't have to cross over to become a success right. i could work with mary j blige and brandy and queen latifah and remain in my community and still make it. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that is my legacy. Um, when I hear those words about my book, I'm proud to have, to, to have shown a light on artists of color. Because it's not that we didn't exist. We've been around. Reggie and Roxana and Quiet Fire and Al Grundy and John Kelman Greer and you know so many. We've been here. Mm -hmm. So if I've been able to bring attention to black artistry, yay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything coming up next for you that you know of? Oh my goodness. There's always next. Um, I'm always working on different things. Who knows when they'll come to fruition? You know, I always have a lot of ideas. Uh, folks always talk to me about cosmetics. Um, that's something that I do think about. Um, but my heart has to be in whatever I do. Mm -hmm. I want to do it uh, in a way that that is something I can reflect on in the same way that I do my book, in the same way that I do my work. I have to be, I have to believe in it. I can't just do it for the money. I have to be able to do something that I, that I truly, truly love and believe that will add um, to the current offerings. Okay. So, so yeah, so yeah. Okay. Who do you think would make a great guest on the Friends and Beauty podcast? Oh my God, Sir John. I saw you already tag him. I know, I know. I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. Um, Rennie, Rennie has a beautiful, beautiful story. And Rennie Vasquez has, has had so many lives as a photographer, as a makeup artist, as a creative director, even without the title, he's a creative director. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so Rennie would be actually lovely, especially hailing from the DMV area. Yeah. Um, I... Yeah, I, I, those two, those two, I think would be brilliant, brilliant uh, next guests. So, yes. Sir John and Rennie, I am passing the baton. I look to see your interview next. Yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before before you go, I have to ask you the Friends of Beauty rapid fire question. So, whatever comes out, just you know, let it go. You'll be mm -hmm. great. The first one: What are the top three keys to your success so far? Oh gosh, gratitude. Say that three times. 
Mm -hmm. um, you can't do anything without gratitude. Um, you can't move forward without gratitude. You can't think about moving forward without first being uh, thankful for your health. Do you know how our hands have to work and how we have to stand and bend over people? And by the grace of God, I still can. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Because I remember when Derek Rutledge, uh, you know, we talked about it, him being obese and having to sit and do makeup. Mm -hmm. You don't have to think about that. We don't have to think about that. So gratitude, say that three times and you'll end up with more than more messages and more items, more, more, you, you'll end up with a list of things to be grateful for that have nothing to do with your business acumen, your ability to talk in front of people, your, your, you know, my, one of my former assistants is deaf. Um, so you just, gratitude, because mm -hmm. we walk through this world with such ease. Yeah. Um, and really, uh, there's, there's so much opportunity out there for us if we start with gratitude. Yeah, so I, I totally agree, I, 100%. How do you measure your success? I'm hard on myself. Um, you know, I think about things that I could have done. Uh, you know, I've been in this industry a really long time. Uh, so I think of different ways to have spoken to people. Um, different ways I could have shown up, um, but that's all done. Um, I try to put that water under the bridge and to move ahead in doing the best. And The Four Agreements, a, a wonderful book, The Four Agreements says your best, do always do your best. Mm -hmm. But knowing that your best always changes is what gives me hope in the next time I'm confronted in this situation or the next time I end up somewhere where I'm not comfortable or I feel I have to speak out or, or I have to tell someone, hey, if you could sit in a high chair, it would help me tremendously. My, you know, I'm tall and so it will help my swing. You know, different ways of addressing maybe the same problem. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, don't, I, try, I work hard not to beat myself up about those things because we still have a life to lead and, 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 and that's just room to grow. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, kill myself because I didn't offer someone the kindest remark. I'm going to hold that and maybe someone else will get it. The person who actually needed it. Okay. What's the best advice you've ever received or a piece of advice that just always stuck with you? Save your money. Yes. And it's not just so you have money. It's so you can make choices that you want to make. Money is freedom. So if I don't want to take a job or if I don't want to work with someone, if I have the money in my bank account, I don't have to. The, the more you set yourself up to have to work, having to work, the more you are a slave to the business. You can't take a vacation because you're going to miss a job. Mm -hmm. Can't miss a job because you need the money. So save your money and sit on it so that you can choose which jobs, which clients and seasons that you would like to work. Mm -hmm. So, so to me, money's power in, in a different way. Yeah. Um, I, I really do think of it as me being able to say like, no, I can turn this job down. I didn't like the rate or that was too much work for the, for the amount of money that they were offering. And I can stand to pass this up. Mm -hmm. I'd be doing that. <laughs> I mean, you want me to do what for what? Okay, I'm, no, I'm good. I can refer some people though. No, a lot of and people. I do all the time because, um, I'm, you know, it, I mean, you know, there it, it's still paying. And and what I say no to, somebody may say yes to because it's perfect for them. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, that's not what I want to continue doing. Mm -hmm. But the only way you get that freedom is by having the finances to be able to, to, to say no. Absolutely. What advice would you give to another makeup artist right now who is just ready to give up 
on being a makeup artist. They're not seeing the results that they want to see. It's just not working. Sit still. It's not going to come to you overnight. That I can promise you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be you sitting still and thinking about all the things that you want to do, all the things that you are not currently doing to achieve that, and, and taking small steps that turn into really big steps that you can start to see how things are unfolding. Um, there's nothing worse than you can busy yourself to death. Mm. I got this client. I got four clients here. I got three clients here. Oh, I'm going here. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. You got to slow down and get still to really hear the voice that is not make money, save money, go on vacation. Oh, post more, do more. Um, I didn't post today. I don't have anything. I, you know, what, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? All of that is noise. Yeah. So you've got to get still and really start thinking about what it is you actually want. And a lot of times that may not be this business or it may be a facet of this business that you're willing to let go of the, the, the dream that being a celebrity artist um, may not afford you. It may not afford you the lifestyle that you wanna work with Cardi B, but Cardi's always working and you have a, a husband and children and a family that needs you and you can't travel that much. That's okay. not a good job for you then. So you've gotta be realistic in what you want and how it works for your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why I ask people when I'm in class, what would be your idea of success? I don't have children. I don't have a spouse. So it's very easy for me to go somewhere tomorrow to take a job. No one's depending on me. My family's well. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not in a position where, uh, I'm in a position, I'm sorry, I'm in a position where I can fly somewhere for the week and not have to think about a babysitter or, or my parents care or a dog sitter or any of that. So you have to think about how you're, what you're asking for and how that actually fits into the life you actually want to have. Right. Because I find a lot of people being unrealistic. I want your life, but I want to also have a husband and kids. I don't know how that always goes together. Mm -hmm. I don't, not during my formative, formative years when your life is not your own. You don't have the luxury of, of passing on jobs because they could be pivotal to your success. Yep. Okay. So you've got to be realistic in what, like, is what you're asking for, does it really, does, does it really speak to your lifestyle? You want to work with supermodels, but you live in Iowa? Well, I can tell you that's probably not going to happen. Right. So you're going to have to think about moving. Well, I don't want to leave my family. Then you, then mm -hmm. this isn't going to add up. Exactly. And those are facts. That's not just me just like, oh, well, you know, it's always possible. The reason celebrities live in LA and New York is because it's easier for them to get around and do the things that they need to do. Yes, when you make money and you can live in other places and fly in and take these jobs, of course, but you also have to have the money to deal with family and, and, and all of the other things that go along with it. Mm -hmm. so you have to make yourself readily available before you actually have a career that you can start making those kinds of choices. All right. Yes. Sound up. <laughs> What's a resource? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm sorry. It just kind of gets me. Yeah. I just say this because I think a lot of people have this kind of idea of what they want. They but it doesn't add up. Sacrifice. It doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. You can't have that life doing what you do, needing to be where you need to be, it's not going to work. Yeah. So you're only frustrating yourself because it's, you're, 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 you're casting a net in a space that they can't collect what you want. Mm-hmm. Ooh-wee. <laughs> What's a resource that has helped you in your business that you could share with the friends and beauty community? Oh, the makeup show. 
the makeup show, IMATS, all of those things. I love the makeup um, show. I will show up at a class. I will show up at an appearance for IMATS or the makeup show because what, what, what you're doing is you're hedging your bets. Now you've got this collective of artists working at so many different levels that you can come in contact with. Same thing for a class. I don't know if you remember this, but I always say, stay in touch with the person sitting next to you. Mm -hmm. Ask them how artistry is going for them. Hold them to task. Have them hold you to task. So, so that we both know we're both working towards something, but it's not foreign. I'm not talking to my mom. I'm not talking to my dad. I'm not talking to my cousin, someone who has no um, understanding of what the industry is like. Talk to someone who's like, wow, you know, I reached out to so-and-so, you know, they're interviewing for jobs. Oh, really? Yeah, you should put something in as well. So now you have a tribe of people who are helping you and exposing you to, to things that you want to learn about. Mm -hmm. Community, community, community. It's not the, the, the networking that is working, it's that you're showing up to commune and to communicate with other artists who are also goal driven. Absolutely, yeah. That's the magic. It's not the networking, it's not the party. It is that we've all showed up, shown up here for, to, 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 to talk about our goals and mm -hmm. to meet our goals and to learn, maybe you can help me, maybe I can help you, maybe we can just hold each other accountable, mm -hmm. which is in and of itself a gift. Absolutely. The last one, I want you to fill in the blank and just say, my name is blank. And the key to longevity and success is whatever you think it is. My name is Sam Fine and the key to a long career is perseverance. Mm -hmm. There are spaces that were not made for me. There were spaces that weren't made for many of the clients that I work with. But you stay in something long enough, you do it well enough, you think of opportunities and you open your own doors and the doors that were closed to you prior. Absolutely, I love that. Before you go, share your social media information or however you want people to connect with you and stay in touch. Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I am Sam Fine on Instagram. Um, I was hacked a few months ago, so sometimes it's hard. I don't know what's going on and, you know, you know, uh, but work to find me because I'm there. And uh, I enjoy conversations like this. You know, I, I obviously have done other podcasts and other interviews, but the more we talk about gratitude and perseverance, the more we're helping another artist reach their potential and to think about getting out of their way and getting in, in, in the industry and mm -hmm. thriving. Um, and and, and cause it's, it's an amazing industry to be in. It really is that, that holds so many possibilities. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of gratitude, I am extremely grateful for you coming and blessing the Friends of Beauty podcast with so much information, so much knowledge, your years of experience for agreeing to take this interview. You have totally made my whole 2023. And just, I just, I'm just so grateful for you. Until Sir John comes on, until Rennie comes on and they take over my spot. No. But it's all good. It's all good. I'll, 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 I'll remain reigning uh, uh, king of, uh, of, of, of the podcast right now until no they one, show me up. No one could take your spot. I told people, <laughs> Morel was my first guest. So when I first started the podcast, I reached out to people who were close. So Morel was my first guest. I interviewed Danessa last year and you, the, you, the, the other, I said, aside from those two people, like Sam Fine is it. So I don't think anybody could top you on my list, on my personal list of artists who I admire and respect. I don't think anybody can top. I, I've done you, Danessa and Morel. I don't, nobody else can top that. They're just extra. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. Thank you. Onwards and upwards though, Absolutely. you know, continue to get different voices and different stories because they're, they're, they're meant to connect. They're ultimately meant to connect with other artists to help them realize that they're, they're not alone yeah. in, in this. At whatever level you are, we're all, uh, we're all doing the same thing, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Sam. Thank you for having me.
I look forward to staying in touch. Me too. Me too. All right, all right. Thanks for listening to the Friends in Beauty podcast. Don't forget, sharing is caring. Share this episode with at least one friend in beauty and subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts so that other friends in beauty can find this show. Plus, we'd love to hear your feedback. Connect with us on all social media platforms at Friends in Beauty, hashtag Friends in Beauty to join the conversation and join our Friends in Beauty Facebook community to stay connected. Talk to you soon.